Well, everybody, thanks for joining us for our second information session on the Vertical Impact Studio, our partnership with Vertical Partners and working with our four, first industry uh, partner in the studio, Leonisa. I'm Sati Rao. I'm, I'm the Chief Product Officer of New Lab. It's uh, our department that runs uh, these studios. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. Um, just a quick sort of intro on the Vertical Impact Studio. This is a partnership between New Lab and Vertical Partners. And our aim is to work with a variety of industries around um, accelerating their goals and their corporate strategies and up finding um, enabling technologies that allow them to grow into new markets um, and ultimately creating opportunities for investment and growth. Quick uh, kind of overview on Vertical Partners. This is one of the leading investment groups based in LATAM. Um, they do a variety of investments across a variety of ranges, uh, focusing on digital commerce, as well as a lot of advanced technology um, solutions out in the world. Um, they bring a variety of industry expertise in the retail manufacturing space as well. And so this has been a wonderful partner to work with, both on just networking in LATAM, access to industries there, as well as being sort of a, a source of potential investment capital on the opportunities that may come out of the studio. And we are New Lab. Um, we're an integrated operating model that um, applies transformative technologies to a variety of problems in the world. Um, we do this across four main um, departments, uh, innovation studios, which we'll talk about today, membership, which basically means managing a large community of frontier technology startups and entrepreneurs. We start new companies through our venture studio, and we, all, we too also invest through our own um, funding fund strategy, as well as the variety of partners. Just to give you a sense of the volume and sort of the scale of, of how we work, this is, a, this, is, this is a snapshot of the work we've done across technology and innovation. We have about 200 plus companies that are quote unquote new lab members. That network that goes beyond that is much larger. Um, there's a, a, a nice aggregate valuation of these companies that has grown over the last few years. And it really tells you sort of the, the kind of the range of companies we work with from early C stage up to about series B, series C are companies that are, that are well within our kind of point of view, not just in the community, but also in our innovation studio work. Um, we have a growing network of seed and early stage investors, including our own fund strategies. This allows us to bring capital to bear when there is an opportunity that we can take advantage of together. Um, our innovation student engagements are growing over 50 plus uh, we've done over the past three years. And we're seeing a lot of great outcomes as a result of that um, as well. So what are innovation studios? This is our opportunity to really apply entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, talent, and, and businesses to solve a variety of large corporate and civic challenges in the world. Um, we do this in areas where collaboration is a need. Um, and this is a great example of that. And we'll talk a bit more on our process and the types of studios that we, that we do. So our process is, is, is a way of creating an intentional kind of design towards an outcome. And so traditionally where you might find um, corporate innovation is a lot of internal work or classic incubation is sort of networking and teaching. This is really about getting a product into an opportunity space. And so we start through our version of design. We work with our partners such as Alianisa and understanding exactly where they find opportunities. What are the barriers of entry in the world they're trying to move into? What are the inspirational technologies out in the world? And we kind of bring those parties together um, about halfway through the program. And this is what just happened recently here in this studio. And the goal is really to define a strategy. What are the types of technologies we're looking for that match really well with manufacturing capabilities, with opportunities? How do you put in barriers that relate to regu regu regulatory issues? If you're talking about things related to health and so on. So that when we do find the startups in the world that we wanna work with, we're able to design testing um, and pilots that, that really uh, create the validation necessary to go to a next step. We find that this process is really great because the intention um, also aligns incentives on the end. If the pilots are successful, the industry partner, new lab, and the startup all benefit from that outcome. This is a model that's been taking off quite well. Our version of innovation, I think, is really becoming more popular by the month. Um, and so what was started back in early 20, 2019, about one or two programs, is now up to about 23, 24. Um, as we stand today. And this is a snapshot of some of the ones that we work with. Uh, generally speaking, we work in the themes of mobility, energy, and materials. And so you can see that well represented in the categories here. And as, as well, you can see we work with a range of entities from large Fortune uh, 500 companies to privately owned businesses to also a variety of public agencies in the world. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Mariella now, our director for the Vertical Impact Studio. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining. I, as, as Satish mentioned, I work with, with his team on the Innovation Studios. I'm director of programs leading this Innovation Studio and others we have in Latin America. Uh, the one that we are wanting to speak to you today is the Vertical Impact Studio that, as Satish mentioned, is in partnership with Vertical Partners and Leonisa. We're seeking innovative companies developing new forms of smart textile with medical and wellness applications. We are currently, as you know, in the open call, uh, looking for these companies, and we're closing that open call next Wednesday. Um, companies uh, that uh, will be selected after this open call, and I will speak about the timeline in, 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 a, in a few slides, uh, will run pilots together with Leonisa's R&D team and Leonisa's investment arm. You will meet uh, very soon the head of R&D at Leonisa, David Urrea, and he will be speaking more about those manufacturing capabilities that they offer. The studio will provide the opportunity to explore new ways of integrating your technologies and co-creating new manufactured products together with Leonisa to seek new businesses and opportunities with this leading brand and retail manufacturer. But before I walk you through uh, anything else, let me go into the verticals, into the uh, both of the verticals that we offer, and I will ask for the next slide, please. Um, awesome. So as, as you have probably read on our website, we offer two or we have two verticals that you could apply for this open call. The first one is advanced functional yarns uh, that enhance functionality for medical or wellness applications. This first one is really focused on advanced material science, including passive indicators, functional coatings, and other nano biotechnology based surface treatments. Basically, functional yarns that don't require any data systems or apps to function. The second one that we offer is the smart sensing fabrics where we're exploring integration with smart textile sensors into um, the fabric through what we have mentioned, the Leonisa manufacturing capabilities. The sensors should be soft, flexible, and can be woven or needed on industrial machines. Something that we like to emphasize for both of these verticals is that uh, they should be a medical or wellness application. Areas uh, that we're looking for in this wellness or medical applications include monitoring and detecting body changes, activity or movement, compression levels, blood pressure, temperature, oxygen saturation, ECG, and other vital signs. All of those are of interest, although we're open to exploring any other that you already have started working with. And uh, with that said, I just uh, want to pass it along to uh, the head of um, Leonisa's R&D, David Urrea. Uh, to speak a little bit more about what is Leonisa all about and why it's so um, interesting to apply for this open call. Over to you, David. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm David Urrea, head of R&D here at Leonisa, and I'm here to basically present to you uh, our company. Uh, this will be done through a video. Uh, please be kind. It was made by our marketing department, so there are some bold claims. But uh, I think it's a good visiting card of us. And uh, with that being said, let's start the video. So Leonisa was established in 1956 by my grandfather and it's a family owned lingerie company. It's considered to be one of the top lingerie companies in Latin America uh, with over 66 years of experience has established quite a foot war here in the Latin America. We have also expanded into the US and sell via Macy's and Victoria's Secret as our partners. We also have a men's brand, which is more geared towards performance. It's called Leo, and it's also being now expanded upon. But we are mainly a lingerie company, which is now expanding into other fields. So what sets us apart? We have different textile technologies. We, we ourselves have created throughout the years. So we create our own textiles. So we also do the knitting. We create all the textiles with a purpose in mind so that we can have functionality with the textile and not just through positioning of the garment. So one of the examples of our established textiles is Power Slim. It's a hexagonal weave, which makes it very breathable but also quite strong in sculpting capabilities. And another one which you will see a lot 
in the market is DuraFit, which is kind of a spandex material. It's a heavy lycra composition, which will sculpt good to the body, but has not that much sculpting capabilities. That being said, how are we able to create our own textiles? We manufacture basically everything ourselves. Uh, up, we are 90% vertically integrated. We start from the fiber, so we don't produce the fiber, but after the fiber, the whole product is created by us. With that, we have knitting technologies, dyeing technologies, cutting technologies, and uh, a large uh, capability of confection. Within those knitting technologies, we have almost every technology which is available in the market. So we have from lace to Russiatronic to all kinds of circular technologies. And with the dye, we also have quite a range of technologies to achieve the results we want for different types of products. As you can see, Leonisa is quite a big company. We have around 5,000 associates with which we create 40 million products a year and export to 19 countries. And we have uh, extended warehouse capabilities and we achieve uh, quite good le uh, level of service. Also, what sets them apart, we're a family owned company with strong family values. And a lot of workers here uh, have reached uh, 25 to 30 years with the company. Uh, and uh, the beautiful thing about Leonisa is uh, the mother starts working here and also the sons then start working here. So it's it's keeping the family tradition alive. Also, uh, we have now, many years ago, started to focus on sustainability and how we can create environment, envir environmentally friendly garments. With that, we are now we're using 60 to 70% of our water for the dyeing process. And we are starting to look at uh, recycled fibers, which could be the future for textiles. And with that being said, if there's any questions, we'll have a q and I think this was a small visiting card. Any more specific questions I'll be able to answer later. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. That was uh, so inspiring, and, and I actually love that video. <laughs> um, so um, let's uh, move on to the studio timeline. Um, for um, the open call, as we mentioned, it opened on June 15th, and it will cl close on July 27th. That's next Wednesday. Uh, we will review the applications in August and have calls one-on-one -on -one with two participants, also to understand your perspective and your view on the pilot concepts that we want to run. Um, to uh, finally have a finalist review and startup selection between August and beginning of, of September uh, with the idea of starting those pilots right uh, straight away um, having a demo day uh, between January, end of January and February. Uh, so as you can see there, there's a couple of months of piloting and something that is very important for this election is that pilot proposal. So think through it when you're applying uh, for the open call. Next slide, please. So as part of our uh, benefits, the benefits that we offer, if you are selected to be a part uh, of this cohort, uh, we offer investment and exposure, a total grant funding pool of 150K to support pilot development and offset associated costs. Something very important that we usually mention is that we take no equity. Um, they, you will also get access to the wide network of 600 angel investor uh, companies that are connected to uh, New Lab. And of course, you would get you would get to work very closely with Leonisa, as you heard. You know their manufacturing capabilities are all in house, so do, you get to uh, jointly co-develop uh, a product. And aside from that, you will also build um, and, and pilot, as as I mentioned also in the other one. You will get to uncover um, technology requirements, uh, meet compliance requirements, launch products, hopefully. Um, 
and then the ongoing collaboration uh, with um, Leonisa and access uh, to the pilot uh, site, design and scope and deploy. And this includes as well uh, some trips to Medellin, Colombia and their manufacturing facilities. And finally, the community and space that Satish mentioned at the beginning, we have our location here in Brooklyn and we have 250 companies uh, that are part of our, of our, that are members and are scaling transformative technologies. You will get to be a member for the time being if you are selected and of course get access to 5 million on-site prototyping facilities and resources and network. Um, and if you have any questions about any of these benefits or anything that we have mentioned, I want to encourage you to put questions in the Q&A that will open right after uh, this talk uh, from our advisor, Despina. So let me now introduce um, a, our speaker and advisor, uh, Despina, is a leader in wearable technologies with more than 20 years of work experience in textile innovation, from ideation to products, uh, working in, the, in design systems for startups, but also for Fortune 500 companies. And we're very excited to have her as a senior advisor for this studio. She's supporting us in the selection, in the pilot ideation for the remaining of the studio. We're thrilled to have you, uh, Despina to be a part of our, of, our, of our team and of this info session. So I would pass it now to you uh, for a brief talk about uh, the challenges and the opportunities in this sector. Over to you, Daspina. Thank you so much, Mariela. It's, uh, it's great to be here and I'm very excited to be part of this uh, venture um, because um, one of the main challenges that we see in, um, in wearables, in e-textiles, in smart fabrics, in functional advanced fibers, they, they have many, many different names from that, uh, has been manufacturing. So we have seen great growth and great innovation uh, in both material engineering and in electronics take place in this space for the past 15 to 20 years. Um, but one of the main challenges are around manufacturing. What are those challenges? The main one is around integration techniques. How do you integrate the various materials, whether those are um, material, passive materials or uh, electronics into um, the supply chain and the, the production of a final garment? So the textile supply chain and the electronic supply chain are very different and so are the equipment that is involved in the production of each. One uh, great problem that really feeds into that integration is interconnects. In other words, a soft to hard interface. Fabrics are very, the, the, the wearable environment, it's very unforgiving and so is your washing machine or even your hand washing. So how do you create a, a connection between electronic interfaces and a garment that can be robust and can withstand both the movement of the body as well as the hardship of the washing machine or detergent, et cetera. We also, uh, personalization is something that's very important in this space. Uh, everybody's different. Uh, their medical applications are, are notorious for wanting to be personalized and fit to the body correctly when we're talking about shaping, which presents its own um, challenges in manufacturing. And then in many cases, when we do talk about uh, sensing textiles, we are talking about software and the development on, of software and hardware and have to integrate the two, both in terms of functionality, but also in terms of branding, in terms of design, et cetera. So um, how do we go from creating one or two or 10 or even a thousand prototypes to scaling up for large area fabrication. That scalability has been uh, a problem that many organizations and many universities and many um, collabor collaborators are trying to address, but it, de it demands um, quite a lot of commitment and rethinking uh, and, and an understanding of the technology of both the garment the textile and the electronics. Uh, can we go to the next uh, slide? To become a bit more technical, when we talk about interconnects and maybe some of these challenges resonate with, um, with you and my surface in the applications, we're talking about what is a contact resistance? How do you maintain a, a connection that keeps being robust and has good connectivity and a material that does not corrode? 
um, if you upside onto the fabric or if you put if you laminate your connector, how do you make sure it doesn't delaminate? So what materials, how do we rethink the stack of materials that goes from fiber to electronic to connector to covering the connector? And of course, that it does not uh, present any defects under the strains that I discussed earlier. Now, if you were talking about larger areas in a fabric to, to really, um, to really uh, take on the opportunity that the textile gives you, then you start having parasitic capacitance and resistance. Uh, and if you want to have high special resolution areas, so you could uh, start sensing larger areas. Power, uh, we still can bend the, the laws of physics. We have seen incredible um, advances in power, um, mostly because a lot of our electronics are becoming less power hungry, but it still becomes a sore point. Uh, but again, there are quite a large number of startups that is addressing this issue and trying to create also woven batteries, uh, batteries that they directly integrate into the fabric. Um, if we're talking about systems that we want to have wireless communication in order to communicate uh, the data that is captured, then we're looking at to develop soft uh, wireless communication systems that have low latency. In other words, that they can have high speed data in novel materials like conductive yarns or other alloys that could be used in weaving, knitting or embroidery. Similarly, uh, in terms of uh, signal processing, if you're starting to collect a lot of different uh, points of sensors, then how do, you how do you process these signals and how do you communicate that data? And which means that there is quite a high demand in, de in, in developing electric materials that have high conductivity and to think of new device architectures in that space. Now, on top of that, we have design challenges. If we can go to the next slide, please. And that means that now you are used to developing electronics, but now how do these electronic components or new architectures fit into the into a garment that is comfortable and it confronts it conf confront to uh, conforms to lifestyle and aesthetic considerations? How do you rethink that space when you start introducing new materials and new components in order to really uh, produce um, a successful application, we need to generally have a better understanding of the human sensory system and how each one of us is different. Uh, so many of these challenges, the good news is that they're also become the opportunities and there are areas that we see psychology, neuroscience and physiology coming together to uh, address some of these uh, challenges. You also need to have your software and hardware aligned in terms of design and in terms of to really create a system that is really quite complex as you put all those uh, parts together. Um, also testing in real life settings. Many of the projects that we've seen, many of the products that we've seen um, are starred in limited numbers as prototypes and they don't have the luxury or the benefit of being able to test it in real life settings outside the lab, outside of your user, um, uh, um, narrow user testing uh, run. Sustainability uh, also demands an interdisciplinary approach and, and teams, which is not always easy to come by. Um, and also in terms of sustainability, it's great. Uh, the, the, the textile industry and the, and the apparel industry has gone done great forays into, um, and as we just saw with a great video that David showed, but what happens then when you start develop, uh, adding new materials like um, uh, silver or other, other materials of that sort, and of course, electronics. How do you go about recycling and uh, who is responsible for that part of the equation. They're very standards. Uh, there, we have different uh, bodies like ICP or ATTC that are looking to develop standards for wearables and e-textiles, but they're still in um, an early stage. And then on top of the regulations that someone would have to consider uh, for a garment, now if you're going into the medical space, you also have to think of FDA, HIPAA in the US, GDPR in Europe, FCC, if you're going to have communication. So you start creating a more complex uh, system of regulations that you have to be aware and know how to navigate. But as I said, the good news is that many of these challenges, if you flip them, 
really become an opportunity. So if we can go to the next stage, the next slide, please. Now, the greatest opportunity is that our human skin is our largest organ, and it covers about an area of approximately 22 square feet, which is a pretty amazing area if you think about it. So that means we now have the opportunity to have, to sense, um, to sense a wide variety of, of uh, biomarkers of, of, uh, that we can, we can have with the textile uh, a greater opportunity to uncover what's happening in the human body. And let's not forget that car garments have been worn for over 5,000 years. So if you put the, th the two together, the fact that we are always covered with a garment or for the most part um, in our daily lives, there's a great opportunity to start rethinking what sensing means. We also have been seeing some great advances in new materials and general in material science um, the past decade or so. Now, another part that is really interesting to, to consider is that we're now having smart watches are becoming a lot more common with a lot more of accept, um, user adoption and much more complex ambient sensing environments, which means that we could take that information, that data and combine it with what we see happening on the body. And that means that we can start developing a very complex and elaborate model of what's happening on the human body. and that means then that we can start maturing uh, the machine learning models we have in terms of predict predicting predictive models, et cetera. We're also having an expanding understanding of human physiology and biomarkers, um, which directly leads into how people now approach health and well-being. And the boom that we see in, in well-being applications, but also how um, consumers are taking ownership of their health in a very different way and also the relationship that exists with the medical establishment. So that also brings a lot of uh, opportunity in this space. And on top of that, we're seeing really uh, interdisciplinarity and collaborative models. And I think New Lab is a great um, model for that and a great supporter of exactly that kind of interdisciplinarity and collaboration that needs to take place in order to have true innovation and solve some of the wicked and stubborn problems that we have been facing with our health and in our relationship to our environment. So these are some thoughts that I'm hoping will spark some ideas or opportunities, or you can maybe identify yourself in both uh, as you are working to solve some of these challenges or addressing some of the opportunities or you're part of that opportunity space. So um, I think that would be, I would love to now have a conversation with David on how Leonisa approaches both the challenges on, and the opportunities that we see in, the, uh, in this space. So hi, Despina, I'm here for you. Okay, David. So my first question um, is, what do you think is the relationship between being a vertically integrated company and the ability to scale a solution in the smart textiles and, fa and functional fabric space? Well, I think we're quite a good playground to start messing around with more industrial focused machines. So a, a lot of startups we have seen lack the access to uh, the type of machinery you would use in an industrial setting, especially in the uh, knitting side of things. So we think being vertically, vertically integrated, we could have the machines that you would need to start adapting to a newer necessity or new types of materials. And we would also have the processes that come afterwards. So we would then, after being able to knit the fabric, be able to dye it and see what the impact of the dyeing process is on the smart woven, smart knitted fabric. And then we would be cutting it so we could see what kind of impact or what kind of machines you would need to cut it. So it would be a much easier prototyping space, I think, because you would not have to divide your solution into some steps. Because a lot of these companies in our textile world are highly specialized. There's one dyeing company, there's one textile company, there's one cutting company. We have that all in one, so it becomes quite interesting because you can do onto the whole garment, if you want to do a garment, the whole process straight through, 
and quite quickly and quite effectively with the setups we have right now. And also our technical teams are quite experienced in handling challenges and modifying machines to the needs that we see fit because we created our own textiles and we've experimented a lot in that space. So I think uh, we have a good technical support for newer experiments on machines that have not been done. And we're also willing to allocate those resources and that time to start developing those types of fabrics. I think that's fantastic. It sounds like a, like a dream because you're absolutely right. I've, I was involved in a project with a large company and there were seven different uh, places that we had to navigate. So in terms of both of project management, but also the timeline and the communication to, to have all of that under the same roof is, is incredible. And not to mention your great knowledge of the human body and form and shape and pattern making. I think that also feeds into the equation, correct? Yes, uh, this is something we've been developing in the last six years is we've tried to understand more the implications of a garment on a body. So we created our own movement lab and our own pressure lab. So we started to have a more scientific approach to what a garment does on the body and why some garments work on some types of bodies and why some garments don't. And with that kind of knowledge and the pattern making and the process we're now establishing to create garments, uh, we have a more scientific focused view. So deviations and decision making becomes quite easy, which uh, it wasn't before because we are a traditional company and we come from the tradition of French uh, corsetry and it's a different world because uh, designers have much more influence on how processes were guided and uh, things were made. Now it's starting to shift into a more scientific engineering space, which has had some benefits. Uh, we've also had trouble with the designers, but uh, we're starting to have a good understanding between the engineering side and the designer side. So I think it, for garment making, it's a very special place right now here because it's, it's developing and it's interesting right now. And we're learning many things. And I think that's, that's again, I think a fantastic opportunity because one, as I was alluding earlier, when you start adding electronics and wiring and, and components to be able to have that, that engineering approach uh, is, is quite important. You somewhat answered my, my next question, which was, you know, people often don't realize just how much technology and engineering goes into a garment. Um, in fact, uh, the first space suit, the Apollo space suit was in the end developed by a company that made bras, Playtex, because they were the ones that could actually handle the soft materials and they understood um, how, how to make it. Um, so, so my question, what, what, what is your relationship to technology? And I think you already answered that question and more. Um, so I'll move on to my next one, which I, is- I think we're evolving, uh, just to give a point that because- please. Uh, there's a traditional world and uh, there's how things have been done for the last 50 years. And uh, now we see an opportunity to create a new world to establish different designs because of a functionality and not because of a look. So that's where we're trying to move our company, some lines in that direction. So what pressure should a garment have over the body? What's the maximum pressure? What would you be looking for? Uh, what geometry would you be looking for? What acceleration would you be looking for in movement? Those start being very interesting factors so that we can back up our marketing claims when we create a product. So that was the focus and to start drumming down those discussions that arise throughout the design process of why a strap should be wider or thinner, uh, it, there is a reason why it should be wider. So discussions and the design process becomes a little bit more locked in, but the functionality is then given. So we think we are evolving in a good direction there. And I assume that's also a process that we could be adopted uh, in with with the startups and the the people who per, who participate in the in the venture. Uh, we think we're a good playground because uh, we have a complete understanding of garment making if uh, that's uh, the end product 
and we can now be more sure if we want to create a better contact area how to approach those types of problem sets or if we want to minimize movement in a structure we can also now measure that which has is not as easy as one would think so right, a lot of problem sets uh, we have already kind of tackled so we would hope we could be a, a great help in developing some sort of uh, fast garment uh, creation because we understand mm -hmm. why a garment should be the way it is to some That's degree there's still a lot to learn but we are starting to be more assertive in why we create things the way we create them. right um when you were talking earlier um in your video about the fact that you're vertically integrated and the control that you have uh and the understanding one of the things that you also um you mentioned but not so much is that you also you're a brand which means that you have a direct connection to the consumer and you can get a lot of direct feedback from that relationship so my question my next question is as healthcare and personal monitoring devices and well-being in general is reconsidered what do you think is the role of fashion and apparel in this space or in other words what do you see for you as a fashion brand um, as being the opportunity in the in the medical and well-being wearables for Leonisa. So this uh, idea of creating, let's say, more smart products for a medical side is something that did not come from nothing. We were uh, making a lot of pressure garments for mostly for slimming down people to fit into dresses, but then we saw that some of the plastic surgeons started to approach us and to tell us that those types of garments are helping them in the post-operative space after liposuction and oh, those types of things so we started to look more into how we could create products that uh, fit into other niches so the medical niche becomes a world that is very interesting and has a lot of space to grow and it's not quite understood from the textile side so we see a lot of potential opportunities there uh, it started off with uh, simple compression garments for liposuction or post birth and now we are trying to evolve this idea into much more complicated problem sets or evolve around those ideas because we see there's a lot of interesting niches that one could address. Wonderful. So, um, so in, in a way, you you it, innovation seems to be very much at the core of your company, one way or the other. Um, so, what does innovation mean to you, really? Well, we are trying to. Uh, for me personally, innovation means uh, starting to create uh, more scientific based arguments around why something should be the way it is because uh, we have class a lot with design me especially as an R&D head and there's a lot of discussions around why things should be the way it is and then getting down to a language where things become scientific uh, you'll see that results start to come in much quicker and you can convince people that it's the way that the scientific process kind of dictates and it's not what the opinion or the prevalent opinion is of somebody so for me innovation is creating better products through knowledge and that's what we are trying to strive for here at leonisa i love that answer better products through knowledge um so we have some questions from the audience that i'd like to to ask you so the first one is how do you see leonisa working with different stages of startups and technologies um i'm not oh. sure well, I think this is a, a more new lab centric. Uh, yeah, question. question. That's what. Because uh, there's a prototyping stage and there's some results that have to be shown. We are very open to different stages of prototype development. It's not, this is not a project that uh, all the products should be done in one year. I don't think yeah. that's uh, the approach. We, we want to build this uh, approach into a long lasting innovations lab. So right. any stages are welcome. If it fits into the new lab model is a different question, but we are also uh, open to discussing 
other forms of integration with the startups. But any part of development is very welcome. As long as Great. we see some side of opportunity, business opportunity on the other end of the development. Yeah, and, and I think you're- Very important, scalability. Scalability, where, which is, of course. Yes. And because you are, you're a company, you're not a lab. So, um, so which brings us to the next question, uh, which is for both of us, uh, but I would like you to answer first, of course, is what are the three things related to a textile technology that an entrepreneur should be mindful of when they think about manufacturing and scale? Now, well, first of all, uh, it's uh, your market opportunity and the cost of production. So. Uh, it's a quite easy equation. What's the market I can address and how much does each garment cost and how scalable is that production and what kind of effort would I have to do to scale that production to be to address the market size I have. And also uh, going away a lot from fashion because fashion is a more, let's say, mass volume that, that one does through a design line, you would be having a different type of product, which is a more made to order kind of product in these types of fields, I think. It won't be a widely available product with smart technologies. It would be something that you would have to scale depending on its complexity, not as a, let's say a fashion shirt, which you would make tens of thousands, 100,000 of, you would be looking more into the five to 10,000 a month something like that, depending on its complexity. So I think the scale and the addressable market are very important as a business equation before one goes more into the deeper detail. So in other words, it's the same as it's with any any product, but um, I have a feeling that our, our attendee was trying to engage if there's something about textiles in particular that is different from um, from uh, another another product category? Uh, textiles is a very old technology, but that being said, it has its quirks. Uh, the knitting machines are quite monopolized in how many companies use that technology. Circular machines are more open, but it's also a small world. So yeah. there's not a lot of major development done in these kinds of things. And those machines, uh, the innovation that has come throughout the last 20 years, I think, is the machines produce faster or in, and are more reliable, but they do not innovate much more on how they draw or how they create a textile. So in that regard, you're limited to some degree on how to create a textile. But right. that world is so large and you have so many opportunities with the technologies that are out there that I think it's very a very unexplored field. What you do require for people who want to go into textiles is a skilled technical team with a lot of experience in those machines because these machines are quite finicky. And any changes you make, you have to know the causality relationship between those changes because if not things go horribly wrong and to get a stable textile production is quite difficult in our experience yeah i i agree with you completely and and I've, i had a project that i ended up once doing in el salvador and working with good operators who know their machines well it really uh, makes all the difference so my answer would be to really educate oneself on how complex textile production is and garment production, not just textile, and what all the steps are in it, and be able to communicate it and and understand what um, you know what that, that journey looks like. Uh, but that would be the same for anything that you want to to undertake. So there's one other question which uh, is is addressed for me, but I would actually like to ask you the question, which is uh, the health is a wide open space. Uh, and the question is, what do you find most exciting in terms of an application where smart and functional textiles can play? Oh, 
as a, with the new lab, we've explored more in depth the ideas of what kind of problem sets you could solve. And there's very interesting problems that, that one can solve and that are very much needed by the medical world today. So I think uh, the need, even from a business perspective, is quite big. So the opportunities, money-wise, and helping people both correlate to something very special. So I think if we can create a product or a fabric that can help uh, revolutionize some medical processes or some patient care after surgery, I think uh, we're looking into a very interesting products that are very good business opportunity and help a lot of people in the future. Yeah, and, and I, I'd say it is a wide field and you know, people often ask me, why haven't we seen more products in the market that address medical needs? And my answer is often that there are not enough Leonisas in the world that are willing to undertake what you're about to, to embark in, to experiment, to open the machines, to bring in, and they have exactly what we've been talking about all along, the control of all these different stages. You have your, you know, your, your, your pattern makers and your, you know, I assume you use modeling software to, to model um, movement and body all the way to then, okay, now let's, no one would agree to just uh, do a hundred yards, you know, two yards, two yards, of fabric, but you can do it and experiment. And I think that uh, is a big, um, it's, it's change making. Also, I think a factor there that is quite important is Colombia's talent pool in the medical field is quite big, also in the textile field. So we see we're a good lab here because we have easy access to respected clinical studies and we can start developing and testing our thesis very quickly here in Colombia, which I think in other countries becomes more difficult. Great, thank you so much. That was amazing. Thank you guys both. I think that's uh, between the two of you, there's, there's obviously a lot of knowledge, both on scaling uh, textiles, technology, and of course the work we've been doing together to figure out what health spaces to, uh, to move into. So really appreciate that. Um, there was another comment, um, David, on the on the question on on areas of technologies. I think you're right um, in terms of in terms of maturity. Lini says seems quite open as we work with you that some of this work we're doing does necessitate maybe earlier stage technologies. Others are more amenable to later stage. I think it depends on the um, what we're looking at in terms of the opportunity there. And I think that's true for a lot of what New Lab does. But since we tend to focus on product more than let's say traditional accelerator. Across New Lab, we tend to not go earlier than seed stage, but I think this this uh, studio will be a unique case. Uh, we are speaking with a variety of academics, for example, around technologies as well. So, but thanks for that. Thanks for that comment. Um, and thanks for joining. Over to Mariella for some final uh, remarks. Thank you so much, Satish. Thank you, Daspina and David, for uh, that conversation that was so insightful. I learned so much um, and for everyone that joined us today, thank you so much. If you have any follow-up questions, please email us at verticalimpact at newlab.com. Remember that the deadline is next Wednesday, uh, July 27th. So uh, shoot us an email if you're having any questions while applying or if you're still uh, you know, figuring out if this is a good fit and we can have a conversation around that. Thank you so much everyone for joining us. I have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. And happy Independence Day. Happy Independence Day oh, yes, for, for the week. Yes. Thank you. Bye. Next time I'll make you work uh, the 4th of July. Uh, I'm kind of figuring <laughs> okay. a way to have revenge. Uh, yeah. Uh, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.